tunggu setia semua tu. Upin nak tutak ko pilih ni apa tu? Amal tu sah ni apa si? Kanu ini kau mana ingin ni pilih resu mengata? Amal kanu ubah inu inu cuta pilih leh resu ni agal mengata temani silap nami. Um, for those of you that haven't yet acquired a working knowledge of uh, Inuktitut, Blakut, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak to you today as the first keynote speaker at the Inuit Studies Conference here in Quebec City. This is an incredibly important conference because of its focus on Inuit, not just on the Arctic. There is a growing interest in the Arctic my homeland and the homeland of Inuit, Inuit Nunangat. But many overlook the people of the region. Uh, I want to acknowledge the important work of this conference in highlighting Inuit, who are indeed the stewards of the Arctic and will be for millennia to come. As Canada's national Inuit leader, I am honored and privileged to represent close to 60,000 Inuit in Canada, our northern homeland, Inuit Nunangat, spans about 40% of Canada's landmass and 50% of Canada's coastline. To put this into perspective, it is a landmass between the size of Australia or, or India or that of uh, Europe. It is a landmass that is peppered with only 53 communities and no real roads. There's one community currently connected by road and that's uh, Inuvik. I think next year might be uh, Tuk Tuk soon. And our communities are accessible only by plane or sea. Uh, the vantage point from Inuit Nunangat has offered an expansive perspective of our planet, removed for much of our history from the developments experienced in southern communities. As such, we look at our world in a completely unique way. Uh, Inuit have only had earnest and sustained contact with the outside world for a generation or two. In fact, there are many Canadian Inuit alive today, some of, some of them who will be speaking before you, who were raised in nomadic communities, traveling the Arctic land and sea by dog team and kayaks, tracking game and marine mammals for survival. In a matter of decades, Inuit have moved from living in igloos and skin tents to settling in static communities in often inadequate and overcrowded homes. The cost of living is staggering. I can fly economy class at least twice from Ottawa to Hong Kong for the cost of flying from Ottawa to Pond Inlet. A family of four from Greece feared has to pay close to about $24,000 just to get to Ottawa. Where we used to get our food exclusively from the land and sea, we now go grocery shopping for packaged food items from the south, where a loaf of bread in some communities can cost $8 and two liters of milk goes for $13, or a case of water for $100. Providing for a family until very recently entailed exclusively hunting, gathering, sewing, and building for the majority of Inuit. It now means going to school and getting a job. We still supplement our diet with traditional food sources regularly, like caribou, seal, polar bear, walrus. In fact, about 70% of Inuit families still rely on country food or a part of their diet. In essentially one generation, we have made the rocky transition from Eskimo to Inuit, and the incredibly rapid speed of this transition has come with its share of challenges. Our communities persi persistently struggle with economic and social challenges, including access to affordable and appropriate food, physical and mental health support, and disproportionate rates of diseases like tuberculosis, infant mortality rates and life expectancy, among others. 
As we work to combat these troubling challenges in our communities, we are actively working to find ways to improve our economic prospects with innovative investments, new jobs, and renewed confidence among our people. The remoteness and relative isolation of our communities for thousands of years has allowed us to learn from the past in a way that isolation has been our saving grace based on our abilities to, to look at the rest of the world and see what it is that they're doing wrong. The remoteness and relative isolation of our communities for thousands of years have allowed us to have that, what, what I call 2020 hindsight. We have witnessed successes and failures, taking notes so we can chart a favorable course for our own people and our own homeland. In our history of relations with outsiders, Inuit opinions have not, al have not always been taken crucially, and sometimes not even really heard. As a hunting and gathering people, our ideas of ownership and governance did not match remotely with the kind of legal and political systems developed by the European societies that brought our first sustained contact with the outside world. This is not to say that Inuit have ever viewed our traditional homelands as a kind of temporary resting place, easily or freely interchangeable with any other part of the earth. Notwithstanding our mobility as hunters and gatherers within our traditional homeland, our collective sense of who we are as a people has always been bound up with the geographic regions we have used and occupied from the time before written history. With the arrival of Europeans, we became exposed to new ideas. One new idea involved the assertion that the world around us has become the property of the crown, whatever that meant. Understanding that concept was even made more complex and more than a little bizarre by the idea that the Hudson's Bay Company had received some kind of charter from the crown in 1670 placing it in second in line behind the crown in ownership lineup. In this process of colonization, we were led to believe that we had no place in that lineup at all. Another imported concept involved the power of the state as asserted through somewhat a mystical ideal of sovereignty. Through a process of colonization, we were doubly disinherited we were told that all lands and waters in Inuit Nunangat were owned by the Crown. And we were told that all the rights and privileges that attach to sovereignty and ownership, notably the power to make binding laws impacting the lives of Inuit, rested in the hands of political institutions located elsewhere. Fast forward a few decades, Starting in the 1960s, a succession of young Inuit decided to take on the larger society that had colonized us and regain at least a degree of control of our own lives. We did not begin this effort by saying we owned our share of the Arctic, lock, stock, and barrel. We did not say that we had rights to do anything we wanted with our share of the Arctic. We did not proclaim ourselves to be sovereign. We took the approach that our decolonization had to feature a fundamental reassertion and rebalancing of our rights and responsibilities with others, including governments located outside the Arctic. In the last quarter of the 20th century, Inuit quickly came to see three major opportunities. First, New issues of common law, Aboriginal title, and Aboriginal rights arose in a series of landmark court cases. Second, there was a search for constitutional reform in Canada. And third, the internal map of Canada left much of the Arctic, for example, the Northwest Territories and regions such as Nouveau Quebec and Northern Labrador in what could be described as a holding category. The work by these young Inuit to rebalance our rights and responsibilities gave way to large regional modern treaties beginning with the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement in 1975 and continued until the Labrador Inuit Agreement in 2005. 
five agreements with the Crown were eventually signed and form a continuous chain across the Canadian Arctic from the Alaska border to the Labrador coast and are protected by Section 35 of the 1982, 1982 Constitution Act. They have interpretive primacy over any conflicting federal, provincial, and territorial laws. Together, these treaties make Inuit the largest non-Crown landowners in Canada by a considerable distance, and much of this land has rich mineral potential, and our treaties provided us with a capital funds to kickstart economic development ventures. The Arctic was removed from mainstream political focus, but at the same time also removed from some traditional barriers to political change. Our land claims agreement with the Crown and other political achievements have opened a new chapter. Fast forward a few decades more to today, with our agreements with the Crown being implemented, we find ourselves with a new wave of, ex of external forces that are pushing into our homeland. The romanticized visions of tundra and frozen seas, as well as the quest for economic gains in our vast territories. I do not hear the voice of consideration or any consideration of Inuit in the recent clarion calls exclaiming the Arctic is the next frontier or encouraging, or encouraging Californians to save the Arctic. The lands, ice and waters of our homeland can no longer be considered res nullius or an empty space belonging to no one. A recent Supreme Court decision with the Silcotan First Nations identified that when we exercise our traditional rights of harvesting in, at point A and at point B, that area in between is still our traditional lands. And that's crucial and very important to, to know. Being that I grew up in uh, Resolute Bay in the, in the high Arctic, north of the Northwest Passage, uh, during the winter and the spring, every year we'd go down across the Northwest Passage down to Somerset Island for a traditional fishing and hunting grounds. And now the world is looking at that passage and saying, these are international waters. Well, no. That's my area of transport. That's my corridor. So you need to speak with us about that. that we have populated our territories and creatively harnessed its many renewable and non-renewable resources for a long time must continue to gain acceptance for there to be any sort of true sustainable development of the region. In the context of our planet's changing climate and intensified global efforts to explore additional resource development, assert modern sovereign lines, and establish newfound transportation channels, it is our commitment as Inuit, and indeed our responsibility, to be at the table ensuring respect for each other and our land that will determine our future. Inuit are not, nor do we want to be, simply observers in a changing world. We have a vision for our homeland, and we will continue to be active, adaptive players in this modern world. Inuit have indeed become important actors and active participants in Arctic research, sharing knowledge, identifying and defining research questions, acting as researchers and authors, and so on. And Inuit knowledge is now giving form to scientific dialogue. It is becoming more and more respected among the research community that our descriptions and explanations of our Arctic environment is crucial because of its richness, deep reaching understanding, and, preci and precision. Uh, later on, uh, you will be hearing from one of my very respected, I call him a leader, I also call, call him an elder, he may not consider himself an elder, uh, Louis Taparchuk. I prefer to call him Professor Louis. 
and the vast amount of information and knowledge that my elders have. A biologist in Nunavut had uh, worked in, uh, in, in, within the government um, of the NWT, the Nunavut, and it took that biologist three decades to finally realize that Inuit, the hunters, were more accurate about population distribution and population trend of the polar bear than he was with his theoretical models. 30 years it took him to finally realize that these hunters were actually more accurate. And he started finally saying to them, okay, well, how many do you think you should have in your quota? Because based on his recent models over a span of 30 years, he realized that he wasn't doing it right. So he started referring to and deferring to the Inuit and saying, okay, what is it, what is it and how is it that you do this? When we say local knowledge, our local is not the southern local in, in, in the, the sense of the word. Our hunters have a range of 500 to 1,000 kilometers. And when you look at Inuit Nunungat and the amount of hunters and gatherers and fishers out there that have intimate knowledge of their environment, it spans across the Arctic, unbroken. It's a continuous stream of local knowledge. So when, when people say, according to traditional local knowledge, there's more meaning to that when it comes to Inuit Nunungat. Inuit are the only players who have the advantage of building on a rich ancestral wisdom that allowed us to thrive for thousands of years in one of the harshest climates. It is this intrinsic, intrinsic and pragmatic traditional knowledge that should ensure that we have an irreplaceable seat at any table discussing development in our homeland. Sustainable development in the Arctic can, of course, mean many things. It can mean developing resources at a moderate enough pace to stretch out their use into a distant future. It can mean doing everything possible to avoid a blowout environmental disaster that will derail development entirely. It can mean dealing with market-driven cycles and investment decisions in such a way as to avoid false starts and to temper abrupt stops to projects. It can mean recruiting and keeping a trained and motivated workforce, but it must also mean something else. Arctic Canada is Inuit Nunangat, the Canadian Inuit homeland, and sustainable development in Inuit Nunangat now means securing and maintaining the political confidence and support of Inuit. Our treaties, upheld by the Constitution, have created new, more coherent regulatory machinery for the management of lands, water, and wildlife, and for the review of development project proposals. The various proprietary and jurisdictional features of the treaties are complementary. They govern how development will take place. They guarantee a strong, if not exclusive, role for Inuit in the assessment of development proposals. These agreements do not give Inuit an unqualified veto on most forms or occasions of resource development. They do, however, create a kind of tripwire with a very clear message attached. And what is that message? It is that proponents of major development projects in our homeland should actively seek Inuit partners. And in all cases, they must turn their minds to how their proposals can develop and can deliver maximum sustainable benefits to any communities and households, as well as returns to their shareholders. We know that to own our future, we must achieve a new level of economic self-sufficiency and to do so in ways that bring our cultural values into the new economy. 
and we must pursue that new economy in ways that are environmentally rational and responsible. Our work towards enhancing rights within Canada has been accompanied by parallel efforts, along with Inuit from the rest of the circumpolar world at the global level. In that regard, Inuit played a key role in the creation of the Arctic Council. We were heavily involved in the 20-year development of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. More recently, we have worked together at the circumpolar level to provide the world with two key declarations as to the Inuit view on some key Arctic topics. In 2009, we released a circumpolar Inuit declaration on sovereignty in the Arctic, and in 2011, a circumpolar Inuit declaration on resource development principles in Inuit Nunat. For those of you not familiar with them, I encourage you to become familiar with those important documents. In doing so, I am confident that you will see that, particularly in the case of the resource development declaration, Inuit from around the circumpolar world have provided an informed, sensible, balanced, and transparent set of principles to govern resource development that properly and fairly applied can meet both the challenge of securing and maintaining the political confidence and support of Inuit and can also meet the many other tests of sustainability. Ultimately, our objective is to encourage social well-being and build self-reliance, as we always had been prior to European contact. We must continue to take the long view. While the development of oil, gas, and minerals may be the key to our flourishing, we cannot afford to take a narrow perspective. Climate change is a prime example. The Arctic has proven to be a harbinger of change in our global environment, the proverbial canary in the coal mine. Indeed, Inuit were among the first to raise the issue of the world's changing climate with the thinning of the ozone layer, an appearance of PCPs and persistent organic pollutants, and so on in the Arctic environment. In recent years, Inuit have seen countless campaigns, oftentimes well-intentioned, emerging from the South to save the Arctic, but few of these campaigns actually make an effort to engage those who still live in and off the Arctic land and sea. Inuit experience the ongoing changes in the Arctic firsthand, and we know that much of what we are now seeing are not a result of our own activities. Save the Arctic campaigns need to first look at what is happening closer to their own backyards before setting their sights on our homeland. Drive your cars less. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Look at where the pollutants are actually coming from as simple examples. If you want to stop the oil and gas industry, diminish the demand. Very simple. Similarly, our Arctic wildlife are inappro inappro inappropriately being used as poster species in climate change campaigns. A recent program on the Canadian Bra Broadcasting Corporation, The Politics of the Polar Bear, Threatened Species or Political Pawn, finally shed light on an issue that Inuit have been talking about for years. While decades-old projections predicted dramatic declines in polar bear population due to changing sea ice conditions, recent studies, both on population estimates as well as the health of polar bears, do not support those hypotheses. These studies indicate that the polar bear population in Canada, where more than 60% of the global population reside, is both stable and healthy, and in some areas, on the rise. Inuit awareness of the, re of the region and our traditional knowledge affirms the scientific evidence. But many organizations, some with a lot to lose, continue to push the narrative that the polar bear population is in decline, which in turn impacts our ability to use our land and our resources in the way we have done for many years. 
Despite the long history of efforts towards cooperation, Inuit still find it difficult to raise awareness, awareness about the value of our governance and decision-making systems, as well as our knowledge and our Arctic vision. It is troubling when our homegrown capacity to address the intensifying pressures we are witnessing within our homeland is discounted. We continue to assert ourselves as modern participants in today's world. Despite the challenges, we are making strides, and I have great hope for our communities and our people now and in the coming generations. Because in the end, Inuit have been and will continue to be stewards of the Arctic for millennia to come. Thank you.